Um, it's been a couple of weeks since we were looking at uh, Second Samuel, and so of course uh, I don't need probably don't need to explain the whole pre previous story. I just need to say David and Bathsheba. That was the last story we looked at, and I think probably many of you are familiar with that story. It was one of uh, I think by my count David broke five of the Ten Commandments in in one relatively short span of time. And so this was obviously a low point in David's life. And uh, chapter 12 kind of continues that. And I think it's important to note that actually chapter 13 and 14 and onward are really still very low points in David's uh, life. Uh, that's important for us to know because as I've said before, uh, the Bible doesn't just give us a, a nice long storybook of uh, heroes that we should try to imitate. Right? That's really not the point of Scripture. The point is that there's one hero, and that's Jesus, and every other person points to our need for Jesus, including the, the so-called heroes that we look at. Um, so 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you're reading from the Pew Bible, it's on page 487, and we will read uh, through uh, verse... Um, oh, I wrote it down. Verse... Well, it says the whole chapter, but we're actually not going to read that. We'll, we'll read through chapter um, uh, 14, 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, and drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despise me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went to, into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his house stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. And I'll keep reading a couple of verses. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him that his child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, brothers and sisters, when I was flying last week to Colorado, 
I was on uh, on the plane, and they let you watch TV on some of these flights now. So uh, I was watching Southwest Airlines and watching the TV. Now it was daytime TV, so the the choices weren't all that great, and uh, you know you only had a few channels to pick from. So even then, really not not a lot of good options. And so I ha I ended up settling on um, Dr. Phil. Now again, not many choices. Not not what I'd normally watch, but uh, there I was. And uh, if you've ever seen the show, you know the format is pretty simple. It's basically a counseling session that the whole audience gets to kind of sit in on and watch. <clears throat> and in this case, the story was about a woman who had suffered a profound loss. Her husband, uh, about two years ago, I guess, had been in an accident, uh, injured himself, and spent about a year or year, maybe even two years kind of in the hospital and then coming out of the coma and then he was in um, nursing care and for a little while it looked as if he might recover some of his mobility and some of his, his speech and, and other functions and then he began to kind of take a turn for the worse again and and then he passed away. And so you, c you can imagine the shock and, and grief that this woman must have experienced. But then as, as time went by, the way that she coped with that grief was uh, she turned to drinking and she really um, indulged in alcohol and all kinds of other behaviors associated with that partying and living the wild life. And all the while, her, uh, her children were watching this happen. And they were being kind of left off to fend for themselves and they were becoming more and more uh, grieved watching what their mom was doing and they didn't know what to do, they didn't know where to turn and this woman's life was really just falling apart around her and the kids were worried that she was going to get into an accident and then kill herself and then you know, the kids would be uh, orphaned. So it was really a sad story and so Dr. Phil calls the woman, you know, first he tells the whole story and then he calls the woman onto stage and he's kind of talking with her and immediately, if, if you're familiar with um, uh, uh, some of the way that sometimes alcoholics respond, they she got very defensive. She says, well, come on. I mean, everybody drinks a little bit. I don't have a problem. It's not such a big deal. And, uh, you know, you don't know what I've been through. And so part of the show was kind of, you know, dealing with this denial that the woman was experiencing. And I'm watching all of this, and I'm thinking to myself, maybe what you're thinking, how can anyone deny that? You know, what's the matter with people? Don't they see what's really going on? Don't they see the look on their children when, you know, she stays out late again overnight? And don't they see the way that she's yelling and screaming at her closest friends? Don't you see the damage that she's doing? Right? That was sort of my reaction as I'm hearing this story. And then it occurred to me, you know, there's a way that we all tend to do that. I mean, when we are faced with a shortcoming, or a sin that we struggle with, when someone points it out or brings it to our attention, I think there's a natural part in all of us that wants to get defensive. Right? We say, well, come on, no, you're making too big of a deal out of this. Or we minimize it, right? or we rationalize it. Well, no, it made sense. I had to do it, right? We, we find all kinds of ways to resist facing our sin and our shortcomings. This story in 2 Samuel is really just such a story. God is helping David to face his own sin, but God does it in such a way that it's ultimately it's healing and it's redemptive. And the message of this story is, is ultimately that God helps us as well. He helps us to face our sin in a way that heals us and restores us. Right? God helps us face our sin in a way that restores us. How does he do that? The first thing that God does is probably the most painful part of the whole process. And that is that God has to expose our sin. And nobody likes that. I don't like it. You probably don't like it. Very few people do. What strikes me in this story in 2 Samuel, in verse 1, God sends Nathan the prophet. You know Nathan was one of David's top advisors. He was uh, considered, you know, like the prophet, the messenger from God, who spoke to David and spoke to the king on God's behalf. And what I suppose Nathan could have done is he could have pounded down the door of the palace, he could have stormed into the throne room, and he could have pointed his finger in David's face and said, David, you are a liar. You are an adulterer. You are a murderer. You're a 
coveter, he could have covered all five commands that David had broken, and he could have thrown it in David's face, and he would have been right about all of it. But Nathan doesn't do that. Instead, what Nathan does is he comes to David, and, and he presents this story. Now, for the longest time, I thought that Nathan just kind of said, David, I want to tell you a little story. And it, you know, it was kind of fiction, and David knew it was just a made-up story. But that's not really what's going on. You see, in those days, the king was also the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And so if there were problems or disputes somewhere in the cities or the towns throughout Israel, and the lower courts couldn't resolve them, then they would work their way up, and eventually it would be the king's job to issue a verdict. It would be the king's job to make a judgment on who had done wrong and who was right, and the king would then act as, as the judicial representative. And that is what Nathan is doing here. He's coming to David, and he's presenting this as if it were a real occurrence in the kingdom, which actually in a way it kind of was, He's presenting it to the highest authority in the land, to the judge in the land, and he's saying, David, as, as judge, what is your verdict in this case? What is just and what is right? And so unbeknownst to David, he is, well, he knows he's functioning in the role of a, of a judge, and he thinks that he's about to issue a verdict. And of course, what God is really doing is he's exposing David's sin in a way that it can be heard. He's setting David up in a way that David will be able to hear about his own sin and he'll be able to face his own sin. Right? If God had just kind of barged in the door and thrown it in David's face, and if Nathan had done that, David would have been defensive. Instead, God brings it to David in a way that David will hear. Now, right away, I think that tells us something important. It's maybe not the main point of the story, but I think it's worth noting. We all need Nathans in our life, don't we? We all need people who love us enough to address problems and concerns, but who can do it in a way that we can hear them, right? You've maybe had people who come and they just throw your fault. It's like they take some kind of delight in making you feel dumb or pointing out your shortcomings. We need people who can do it in a way that we can hear it. And we also need to be Nathans. We need to learn how to present the truth in a way that it can be heard. I mean, if all you do is go to someone and say, don't you see what's the matter with you and this and this and this, it's not going to be heard. You need to say it in a way that another person can receive it. Okay? God, That's often how God exposes our need for growth. He uses gracious friends. He uses people who are wise and trustworthy. And we all need that and we need to be that. Now, David, Nathan tells this story to David about the rich man who steals the lamb, the little ewe lamb, from the, from the neighbor next door. And God tells David something about his own sin. Now again, the way that Nathan presents the story is actually a way of exposing not just the actions that David had done, right? Nathan isn't just saying, David, you broke some rules. He's actually exposing something of David's own heart. And we get that when we look a little further into the story because God, Nathan says, this is what God says. And he presents that little sermon there in the second part of, uh, of chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. The first thing that you see about David's heart is that his sin was not just about, well, it was coveting, but his sin lie in the fact that um, he was not satisfied with all that God had given him. And after all, isn't that in a sense what sin always is? Right? Sin is not being content with what God gives us. Here's this rich man who had everything he needed. And the poor man next door had nothing. He's unsatisfied and he steals that, that ewe lamb from the neighbor. It's interesting. Um, the word, the Hebrew word for, uh, for um, uh, daughter, when the, when the, cause the, 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 the poor man says, he loved the sheep like a daughter. The Hebrew word for daughter there is bat, B-A-T, which if you think about it sounds a lot like Bathsheba. So there's wordplay going on there. David is, Nathan is saying to David, you had everything. God had given you everything, and the neighbor next door, he had one wife, one bat, one Bathsheba. He loved her, he treasured her, but you not being happy with what you had, you went and stole what, you, what did not belong to you. That's the nature of sin. 
That's the nature of all sin. It's not being content with what we have or who we are. And it's wanting more for ourselves. Just think of that for a moment. I mean, greed is maybe the first sin that comes to mind. Greed is about saying, God, what you've given me isn't enough for my contentment. I need a bigger house, a nicer car, a fancier vacation. But think about something else. Think about, say, gossip. We don't think about gossip as wanting more, but really gossip is talking about someone in a negative way as a way of kind of cutting them down in order to make yourself look better. I think you can make the case that when we're gossiping, we're saying it's not enough who I am in Christ as a child of God. I need to make myself look better in front of others. You could go on. I mean, uh, adultery, coveting, all of these things fit that pattern. It's not enough what God has given me. I need more. And that's what Nathan exposes in this story. God speaks through Nathan to expose all that that was wrong in David's heart. His lack of contentment with what God had given him. The fact that David had, had been brought from obscurity, from nothingness, taking care of sheep in a field up to the palace in Israel. And David had forgotten it all and he wanted more. His heart was restless. His heart was always seeking more. And David, God exposes that in David. And not only does God expose that, but he also judges it. Take a look uh, in verse um, 5. <clears throat> in verse 5, we read, after the end of the story, then to the end of the parable, we read that David burned with anger against the man and says the, to the man, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who deser- this man deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over. Now, I like our pet, our little cat, you, if you have pets, cats, dogs, whatever, you like your pet. If someone were to come in and steal your pet, you'd be hurt, you'd be angry. I very much doubt that you would demand that the person who did it be killed. Right? I mean, do you see the overreaction here? Do you see David's harsh reaction when, he, when this story is told? David says, the man who did it must be put to death, and furthermore, he has to repay four times what he took. You need to know a little bit about Old Testament law. In Old Testament law, the general principle was if you took something or damaged something of your neighbors intentionally, then you had to not only replace what you had damaged, but you also had to compensate like punitive damages one more. So in other words, if you injured or killed a sheep or a cow or a goat, then you replace the sheep or the cow or the goat that you injured, plus you give one more as a sort of repayment. That was the general principle of justice in Old Testament law. And so the, by those guidelines, the minimum sentence or the sentencing guidelines here for David would be to say, okay, well, what David should have said is, okay, well, the man has to repay the one lamb that he took and then one more on top of that. But David, do you see how far he goes? He says, four lambs and his life. Why is David reacting so strongly here? Why is he coming with such harshness. I want to suggest, the text doesn't tell us for sure, but I want to suggest that it seems what's going on is that David's conscience is seared here. See, all along, David has known that he's not right with the Lord. I mean, his conscience is just must, must have been bothering him to a point. Now, maybe he's hiding it, maybe he's trying to cover it up, maybe he's trying to pretend it wasn't a big deal, but ultimately, David, his conscience is troubling before the Lord, and so he's reacting with this sense of, Righteousness is a way to sort of compensate for his own awareness of his own sin. Now, I'll give you an illustration. This is, uh, we, we see this actually happen today. Um, a few years ago, um, the Attorney General of New York State, I won't name names, I'm not about trying to you know, single out any individual, but it was the Attorney General of the state, and he built quite a career of New York State. He built a career out of going after um, people who were involved in prostitution and other related um, sins. And he had really done that aggressively, and he became quite well known for that. After some time, it came to light that he had been involved in all the very same sins that he had been so aggressively prosecuting for all those years. And his career kind of fell apart after that. He sort of faded almost into oblivion. But People speculated on that, and they wondered, you know, what's, what, what an odd uh, 
seeming contradiction here. And I think what was going on, or one of the ways that you explain it, is by saying here's someone who knew that what he was doing was wrong. And as a way of dealing with his guilt, he sort of projected it on someone else and punished it in other people so that he didn't have to deal with his own guilt. <clears throat> and I think that's what's going on here. David, dealing with his guilt, dealing with his own failures, is lashing out in anger against this person that he thinks actually exists, the man in the story. So David then pronounces the verdict. He issues the verdict. Now keep in mind that um, David thinks that he's acting as the role of chief justice of the Supreme Court. So he's passing down the verdict. He's issuing what he thinks is just and righteous. And we'll get back to why that is important in just a moment. David, uh, then Nathan, responds with probably the shortest sermon application in the whole Bible, right? Verse 7, you are the man. There's the sermon. It hits right home with David in that moment. All of a sudden, David sees it. All of a sudden, David realizes what he has done. And because he's already passed down this verdict, the verdict has come down from the king himself, but now David realizes that that verdict stands against him. He is the guilty one. He is the one that deserves to die. He is the one that has to be punished. Right? God has exposed David's sin, and God has spoken through David himself to punish and to condemn his own sin. Right Now, <clears throat> we hear this, and, and what's so important here is that David's anger seemed righteous. I mean, to David, David must have felt that his anger was righteous. But you have to imagine, David is getting this angry about a little sheep that was killed. Right? That's what he thought. How much more was God angry at David taking the life of this man and committing adultery? How much more angry was God at the sins that David had committed? You see, David's righteous anger here is just a shadow. It's just a flicker of the anger that God must have had towards David's sin. And so then God takes the very same sentence that David had issued, the verdict that David himself had issued, and it is essentially then put on David. David has put himself under his own sentence. <clears throat> and we read through the rest of the story, and we read about uh, David's son dying as a result of that. We actually read, if you were to read a little bit further on and throughout the rest of 2 Samuel, you'll read that at least three more of David's sons die at a young age. Right? David said four of the little lambs, or uh, the man must die, and he has to give up four in exchange for the one that he lost, and essentially that verdict comes to pass in David's life. Now, I don't know about you, but I, there's a part of me that wants to say, wow, that seems really harsh. Right? God seems to be putting down a very severe sentence on David. Why can't God just sort of say, well, David, okay, I accept your apology, don't do it again, and let things go on? Why the punishment? Why the, the reaction? Why doesn't he just count to ten and kind of settle things down? And I got to thinking about that a little bit more, and what I come to realize, and I think the message of, of this text here, and it's certainly fleshed out in the rest of the Bible, is that, Okay, David has this righteous anger towards a sin that he sees in his kingdom. And he's righteous, he's angry about it. How much more is God angry about sin? And then I think of my own life. I mean, when we look around at the way things are in the world today, we get angry when we see people who are, when we see injustice. We get angry at the sins that we see in this world today. I want to go a little bit on a limb. You've seen what's been happening in Portland over the last five nights or six nights, whatever it is. I'm not in any way defending doing a you know, million dollars worth of damage and violence. I think that's horrible. What I do want you to think about is that what you're seeing is a reaction to, what it, what is to the injustice that is perceived in this world. People get angry at the injustice. Now, the irony is that we live in a city and in a state that tends to be fairly secular. And so there's no place to go with that anger. And so I think what we're seeing is people crying out on the streets. And, and, and we can argue about whether or not you know, the, the protests are justified. You can argue about whether or not there's really injustice. But the point is I think you're seeing 
the anger of people at the way things are in the world. That's what all that aggression is really all about. That things aren't right. And if you can't go to God with that, then where do you go? Right? If you think we get angry with the way things are in the world, then how much more does a perfectly just and righteous God look down at this world and get angry at the sin of our world? How much more does God not react to the sin in our world? And so of course God gets angry. Of course he judges sin. Of course he labels it as evil and destructive. Of course he needs to deal with it. He can't just sweep it under the rug. What kind of a God would do that? What kind of a just God would just pretend that sin is not such a big deal? What kind of a God would look at the, at the horrible evil that's perpetrated on one man against another and say, well, you know what? People will be people. Of course God has to deal with it. Of course God has to deal with David's sin here. Right? A man is dead. The sins that David has committed are atrocious. So God exposes our sin. He has to deal with it. But how does this become redemptive? Well, verse 13 <clears throat> gives us David's response. Finally, David is given a chance to speak, and he says, I have sinned against the Lord. All that hiding that David has done throughout chapter 11 and now into chapter 12, the cover-up, the the trying to, you know, worm his way out of the problems that he's created. Finally, 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 David confesses what he's done. Finally, he acknowledges it. Finally, he brings it out into the open. Now, what's so, I think, important about this is that it's, you notice how personal it is. David doesn't just say, oh, I realize, yes, I broke a couple of rules there. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. And if you go to Psalm 51, you know Psalm 51. That's a fairly well-known psalm. It's what David wrote in response to this. And there again, David expresses this much more fully. He says, against you, you only have I sinned. David is acknowledging that, that his actions were not just breaking rules or not following policy or procedure. David's sin was violating a relationship. It was a sin against the Lord. You know, that's such an important discipline for us as well, the practice of confession. We sometimes say, you know what, if we're Christian, we don't really need to confess our sins anymore because we've been forgiven, it's all good. That's not true. That's not biblical. We're called to, to spend time in prayer acknowledging not just that we've broken some rules, but to say, Lord, my heart has strayed from you. Right? That hymn that we sing sometimes, Lord, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. That's the essence of confession. It's, it's saying, Lord, my heart sometimes strays from you. Lord, my heart sometimes wants what more than you have given me. Lord, sometimes my heart is not content with who I am in you. Confession isn't about minimizing. It's not about coming to God and saying, Lord, I've done some things wrong and now I'm in trouble. You know, can you sort of minimize the consequences? No, confession is acknowledging that our hearts are wayward. Now, how does God respond to confession when we confess our sins? Well, in this story, there's pain. There's a lot of pain. David loses his son, and you read the part of where David was yet praying and hoping that God might change his mind, and God doesn't, and he's grieved. So there's pain. God, uh, but, but the fullness of pain, uh, of God's justice is actually spared in this story, right? David loses a son, there's punishment, but Nathan says to David, you will not die, right? In David's justice, the man in the story was to be put to death. But David is spared that. David is spared the full measure of God's justice. When we confess our sins to the Lord, the Bible says that the wages of our sin is also death. We deserve that as well. But the message of the gospel is that God also spares our life. And he does what he does with David. He removes our sin as well. But at what cost? Again, God can't just sweep it under the rug. How does he do that? Well, we have something that David did not have. 
we have a God who in the fullness of time came and he himself would pay that price of justice. In David's story, it's, it's David's son that pays the price. 